uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, next session. Justice J.S. Varma, former Chief Justice, Supreme Court of India, Mr. D. Shiv Kumar, President Aima, Senior Vice President Nokia for India, the Middle East, and Africa, past presidents, ladies and gentlemen. It is only a couple of years ago that we spoke about how India is going to be a superpower, how it will overtake its rivals and become a force to reckon with in the world. Today, we speak about the powerlessness of ordinary Indians to live in a safe and just society. The focus has moved. The voices of many un unknown Indians resonate with many others and use powerful channels to ensure it has been heard. The social media, internet, the reach of these, in, of these mediums of communication have empowered a majority of Indian citizens access to information and opinion. The old adage of control of promises not kept, what people should think, what they should believe in, are no longer holding true. This unknown Indian today knows he has choices, both as a voter and as a consumer. We should not err by viewing recent mass protests as a passing phenomenon. It is imperative for all of us to factor the aspirations of an ordinary Indian in our thinking. These aspirations are as basic as the safety of life and dignity, corruption-free governance, and a fair chance and opportunity to achieve. The sooner this is done, the quicker this country can get its focus back to the business of becoming a nation with high potential and higher ambitions. We are privileged and honored to have with us Justice J.S. Verma, former Chief Justice of India, to discuss this phenomenon. Justice Verma, as you know, has recently headed the Committee for Changes in Law to Improve the Safety of Women. Many of us will remember that Justice Verma, during emergency, held up the constitutional liberties as a judge of the Madhya Pradesh High Court. As a Supreme Court Chief Justice, he checked the practice of obstructive public interest litigations and promoted the idea of judicial accountability by formulating a code of conduct for Supreme Court judges. He was also the first judge to declare his assets publicly. He has headed the Human, National Human Rights Commission after his retirement from the Supreme Court in 1998. With courage and wisdom, Justice Verma has adjudicated several high-profile cases which have great public importance in the course of development of the nation's history. These include the Hawala case and the Ayodhya case. He has led the commission that inquired into Rajiv Gandhi's assassination and he has been called upon to fill governance vacuums in Rajasthan in the 80s and twice has been acting governor of the state. An upright, I have the word tough here, no-nonsense jurist with public interest at heart, Justice Verma is an inspiration to all of us. Here to deliver the keynote address on the session's theme, the year of the unknown Indian, is it the tipping point? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Justice J.S. Verma. Thank you, Mr. Thapa, <coughs> all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a privilege to be here with you this morning and to share with you some of my thoughts. Let me first begin by... Uh, let me first begin by answering the query which has been posed. And the query is whether the year unfolds into a broad-based mass movement or a short-lived bubble of agitation and deferment. My answer would be in the affirmative. And now I'll elaborate and give my reasons for it. You see, the note which was sent to me starts with 
Nehru's words, Pandit Nehru's words at the time of partition. We have to build the noble mansion, mansion of free India where all her children may dwell. Many of you would know or would, and would recall the vision of free India, which Dr. Rajendra Prashad spelled out on the very first day of the Constituent Assembly, 15th of August, 1947. When I read it for the first time, after having been conversant to some extent as a student of constitution with the directive principles of state policy, I was amazed to see the foresight of those people because everything which he said on the very first day as his vision of free India is what you find encapsulated in the directive principles of state policy. Now, the question or the theme for our concern or discussion this morning is something which unless we see what is, what is our constitutional philosophy, unless we first look into that, probably the answer may not be complete. Now, the directive principles of state policy are the principles fundamental in governance through which the concept of welfare state or the vision of free India was sought to be realized. And therefore, it, that contains the constitutional promise. Our constitution, in a way, has also a very significant feature of not merely imposing the duty on the state, but also spelling out the fundamental duties of every citizen. Both of them have to perform a role, no doubt. The responsibility of the national institutions constituting the state is much higher, but it is not as if every citizen, even without being a public functionary, has no role to play. And therefore, we must bear in mind the responsibility on both these accounts. Basically, as I've always understood, the main features of our constitutional philosophy are a social, social order with an egalitarian ethos that is reducing equality, so equality, in reducing inequalities, so that equality is one of the main features of our constitution and distributive justice so that it is not only that we gloat over the number of Indians in the first 10 amongst the world, we also see how many are there below the poverty line. So in that sense, we are far removed from the goal which was set out. Now, since it is a Repub Republican democracy, the focus is on the individual, every citizen. And that's why the citizen's role is expressly mentioned in part 4A, that is the fundamental duties which are enumerated therein. The focus is also on the dignity of the individual, which is mentioned in the preamble of the Constitution itself, which contains the objectives which are sought to be achieved by the document, which is the Constitution of India. So that really being the role of the individual, you see, it is not as if the individual has nothing to do and has only to wait what the institutions of governance do. And that, that is where the unknown Indian, so to say, according to me, comes in. And who, according to me, is the one who is the most powerful because ultimately the political power is equal. Everyone has the same one vote. In reality, it may not be so because of so many dip disparities. That's, that's a different thing. Now, if the dignity of the individual is the assurance given in the Constitution with promises, justice, equality, liberty, fraternity, etc., then naturally the governance must be people-centric and owned by the people. Is it really so? Do we have true representatives who are governing on our behalf? That's a very important question. If they are not, 
then what is the remedy which the people as individuals or citizens have? Now, this is where I think the, the, this is the main thing for us to address. The seven principles, or you see, there was a Lord Nolan committee set up, which you would know, in UK, in a similar situation. And they spelled out the seven principles of standards in public life. The three most important, according to me, are transparency, accountability, and leadership. The leader has to lead by practice, not merely by precept. Transparency has to be there because people have a participatory role in governance. It is not merely that the people have the role only to vote at the sporadic elections and then wait for the next election. They have to monitor the functioning of every, every public functionary and to see that if they move away from the past, they don't perform their functions, then their accountability has to be enforced. Therefore, it is necessary that they must have the kind of information which is needed to perform this participatory role. And there ought to be also a mechanism which is effective to enforce accountability of persons who do not do that. The RTI Act, in a way, is not something which confers a new right. The right was there always in the Constitution, guaranteed in Article 19.1a, that is right to freedom of speech and expression. But what the RTI Act does is to operationalize that right and provide the procedure for exercise of that right. Otherwise, prior to that also, you could file a date petition for enforcement of the right, but everyone knows how difficult it was to do that and how much time it would take to enforce it. This RTI Act has therefore really empowered the people to get that information which is necessary for them to have so that they can make informed choices for decision making. The, the statement of objects and reasons of the RTI Act says, maximum disclosure, minimum confidentiality. But the trend every one of us sees is maximum confidentiality, minimum disclosure. So much so the judiciary, my own fraternity, resisted as long as it could to, you see, be transparent, and it continues to be so. I see no reason why, if our functioning in the court is an open court, open to public, then why should not people know, you see, other things. The only thing they, need, they cannot ask for or need to know is, after a case has been closed and there's a conference to decide what decision to make between us judges, Participation in that is not required. But then the hearing what have we heard and what have we decided, everyone just right to know. If I have a reserved a judgment after hearing it and not deliver judgment, you say, for more than six months, they're entitled to know how many are pending with me. I mean, that, those are things which will act as internal checks. Now, if I, why are not people entitled to know what are my assets so that they can assess whether they are all, whether they are disproportionate or not. So what I'm saying is, it is this movement in recent years really, which is bringing about that change which is necessary to make it a truly Republican democracy. And that is a very welcome change. Now coming to the the last part of it. Well, recent years we have seen that there have been several movements. And the very raised is for this reason that we have seen most of them peter out for a good reason. What difference I see in the latest, which is started on the 16th of December 2012, you see, I think the manner in which the people have responded, particularly the youth, is, make, is what is going to make all the difference. And that is the reason for my confidence. And I'll share with you some of the facts which uh, I recently experienced. And I must tell you 
it was not merely a great learning experience at this age, it was also a very humbling experience. And I thought, the youth of this country has taught us something and made us realize that they are doing something which we have failed to do. And I think there should be no shame in accepting that. The reason why I say it is different is this. The early, of course, corruption is a big issue. And you see, there's been movement for the last couple of years, which everyone sees as petering down. Why do I say that this will be sustained? My own personal impression is this will su succeed for the reason it is not led by any politician or by any leader. Everyone amongst the youth whom I saw on, on the television screen peacefully protesting at Jantar Mantar was his own leader. He was there because of his own commitment. None of them probably knew who was the person standing next to him uh, on either side. And yet, it was a spontaneous reaction, a protest in which the youth collected. And what was more heartening was to fight for the cause of gender justice. And I always use the expression gender justice, not gender equality, because the equality is certainly within that. Justice is a much wider connotation. Now, if the males in such large number amongst the youth were there for this cause and braving the, you see, the winter and also the water cannons, you see, some, I heard some public functionary say, what was there, we only threw water. I said, ask that, I said, make that man stand there and pour a bucket of water and let's see how he behaves. Now, in, you see, and yet, Lati, you see, force was used. I myself saw a, a, one youngster, probably a girl, being pulled from below a bus where she, had, she was hiding to, you see, save herself from the Lati blows, being pulled out by a policeman and given Lati blows boys running and being beaten up, and yet they did not resort to violence. I thought Gandhiji, wherever he may be, he would be very satisfied that at least this generation is learning Ahimsa, which probably we have not learned as well. So, you see, this is the reason why I think it's going to sustain. The earlier ones, well, it's coming out and it's come out in phases, you see, People who were the so-called leaders had some kind of ambition, some kind of ego. Now here, they are not led by any politician. They are led merely by the commitment for the cause. The other part, which I saw more closely, when I was uh, invited to, uh, you see, chair this panel for this purpose, well, it was late on 23rd evening that Mr. Chidambaram, who is not the Home Minister, from his constituency, apparently at the behest of the Prime Minister, rang me up to request me to chair this panel. I said, well, who are the members? He said, whosoever you say, that's how I chose the members. I said, there must be a front rank lawyer, but a younger person in active practice. Now, to cut it short, from the next morning, you see, the only action taken by the government was to ensure someone came and drafted the public notice uh, to be issued, inviting responses, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that, from that very day, youngsters started coming and saying, sir, can we help? Half a dozen young lawyers, all Gopal Subramanian's chambers, from his chamber, his juniors, many others, some students, law graduates, two students, one from Cambridge, the other from Oxford, here in India, for, they came, they said, sir, you're you are involved in this, can we help? Now, this was the team which helped us. It was this team and the chambers and 
office and staff of Gopal Subramaniam was the place. Someone said, are you going to sit there? I said, well, I don't have a big enough place where I can call all of them. This uh, lawyer has uh, <laughs> all the facilities and we need to do the work. That's where we work. And see the global research which these youngsters made. And mind you, each one of them was on his own. You see, his own transport, taking care of all his needs for the whole one month. And working round the clock also. I mean, you could see that they didn't show any fatigue on their face. They would get in touch with their professors in Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and get the material from there. How do you think within, within 30 days, and actually it was precisely 29 days, how much more time available to the government and all the might and infrastructure? They are finding it difficult to do the job, which these youngsters did. I mean, that's the reason for my optimism, why I think it's going to be sustained. Now, the last day, we decided one day earlier that, you see, instead of 24th, 23rd, we'll give the report. One day earlier, I fixed the timing. Mind you, when the report had to be finalized, you see, we, and on 19th, 20th, we met, uh, interacted with more than 100 uh, persons who came from all over the country. I mean, Women organizations led by eminent women who were working for the cause for decades. I mean, they were all there. They helped more than 100 persons we interacted. On the 22nd, past midnight, I and my colleagues finished the proofreading. These children sat there after till the morning to do the second round of proofreading. At 8 in the morning, they took it to the printer, got it printed, and well, you see, also took care that the ink didn't get smudged. And by 12.30, they brought it to us for our signature. Two o'clock, we handed it over, three o'clock, we had it. Now, if this kind of enthusiasm of persons who had no direct responsibility, you see, they were not asked. I and my colleagues, in a way, had undertaken the task, so, we had to do something, but none of them. And each one of them came, and they didn't expect anything in return. At the end of it, they only said they were privileged to work for me. Now, if that is the commitment, why is it not going to be sustained? In the earlier, well, the, what was done earlier to fight corruption, the crusade against corruption, mobilizing the public anger was wonderful. But thereafter, what happened is the reason why it could not sustain. Because if you are looking for something for yourself. And then another important feature was why it could not sustain. That could not sustain because we can't take over the function of the democratic, the, the national institutions. We have only to revitalize them to ensure that they work. That is democratic method. The attempt earlier was, I'm making the law, you pass it, as if the parliament has only to obey, that's not. After all, that's, a, that's an institution created. What has been done now is to say, these are the recommendations, this is the public pressure, this is the pressure of the civil society, this is what is going to work on the politicians. And therefore, you have to make the law, but be, be careful, we have ended the report, I've said, if now they ignore it, they do it at their own peril. Because the only thing of which the politicians are scared is adverse public opinion. And that's not something which they can. So that's the reason, I hope. So the unknown Indian who's made all the difference and has become the tipping point is no day passes when people are not concerned with that issue. That is self show sustainability. Well, you see, I, I'm kept busy by everyone wanting to talk about it. Now, if this is the thing which is generated, and what more, the women feel that something has happened for which they were fighting for long, but now they have a voice through the youth of the country. They are the biggest stakeholders. 
That's the reason I think it's going to sustain. And they are the true unknown Indian who are making all the difference and make the, you see, the vision which was talked.